Welcome to another panel in the series of the Summer of Open Data. My name is Stefan Verhulst. I'm the co-founder of the GovLab, and I'm delighted to be here with a stellar panel that will focus on the third wave of open data. Uh, by the third wave of open data, we typically mean uh, uh, developments in four important areas. One, uh, developments with regard to open data at the subnational level. Two, developments in the space of sharing private sector data for public interest objectives. Three, how do we do all of this in a more responsible, uh, ethical manner? And then four, how can we also promote the concept of publish with purpose so that all those data initiatives are not driven by just the supply, but actually are driven by the demand side. So those are the four topics that we are exploring in the uh, summer of open data as part of our exploration of the third wave of open data. And the summer of open data is an initiative that is organized by the Open Data Policy Lab, which is a, a part of the GovLab in partnership with the Open Data Institute, the Open Data Charter, BrightHive, and Data GovHub at Georgetown University. With that, let me start uh, with the panel, and I will ask each of the panelists to introduce briefly themselves so that we get a sense of uh, who is in the room here, and then we will uh, dive into a few of those areas that I've raised with regard to the third wave of all here. And let me start with Kara. Kara, you briefly introduce yourself and how what you are doing relates to uh, some of the topics that I might have raised already at the beginning. Thank you very much. And first, I want to say it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. My name is Kara Selk, and I'm the Vice President of Commercial Development and Privacy at Streetlight Data. Streetlight Data is a transportation analytics provider, and we are helping governments, private sector, and others in solving the world's most challenging transportation issues. Great, thanks, Cara. And Cara is coming uh, in from Canada. Let's go to then probably the furthest away, which is Rudy uh, calling in from Buenos Aires. Rudy, can you introduce yourself briefly? Sure, Stefan, thank you very much. Happy to, to be here with, with this group and part of this, this conversation. So I'm a head of the local uh, strategy at the Open Government Partnership. It's a, it's a new strategy in the context of, the, of OGP. Um, so we are trying to develop open government at the local level uh, with, a, with a full new strategy that is rolling out this year. Before that, I launched the Open Data Initiatives for the City of Buenos Aires in 2012. And in 2015, I was responsible of the Open Data Strategy for Argentina at the national level. And I also was the chair of the Digital Economy Task Force for Argentina during the Argentina presidency of the G20. So happy to be here um, and, and, and share about the, the, the learnings, the failures, and, and the experience. Great, thanks so much. And last but not least, Tyler. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Tyler Claycamp. I am a, a fellow with the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University, where uh, I direct the, a network of state level chief data officers. And prior to that role, I was the chief data officer for the state of Connecticut for about five and a half years. Great. So let us start there, uh, Tyler, and pick up uh, uh, where you left. Uh, so you were a chief data officer within the state of Connecticut. And so one of the areas that we are looking into uh, with regard to the so-called third wave of open data is really on how can we accelerate the uptake of open data at the subnational level. Uh, and so we'd love to get your experience uh, and also a sense on uh, how is uh, open data at the subnational level doing, especially at the state level? I mean, there's a lot of focus, for instance, at the city level, but the state uh, quite often, uh, or the provincial level, uh, quite often still has a long way to go. And I would love to get your sense on the current state of play and how to go about it. Sure, thanks. Um, so I, I think with the, the COVID pandemic has really shown a light on state level data and generated 
some fairly significant interest that I think maybe wasn't there, you know, back in uh, January or, e or even previously, where we saw a lot more focus on either uh, national level open data or at the city level. Um, we actually, uh, in January, read every governor's state of the state address, and they barely ever mentioned data. And then today, uh, every day they get up and talk about data. Um, and so, while I think over the years there, there has been uh, progress made in uh, subnational and state level open data, I think this pandemic has also highlighted uh, how much additional progress uh, can be made at the state level. Um, for instance, during the pandemic, I think we're seeing actually some regression in some states where uh, they lead with these dashboards uh, with case statistics and then aren't opening up the data um, that powers those dashboards. And in some instances, when they were open, uh, they actually uh, make it less open, uh, if, that's, <laughs> if, if that's a term. Uh, but we're, we're also seeing um, a lot of states where um, they're leveraging this current crisis to to provide additional data sets that that maybe they wouldn't have thought of before. So whether it's uh, more detailed or granular level case counts, um, or even uh, data around economic indicators such as weekly applications for benefits, things like that, um, we are seeing some great progress, and we're seeing additional partnerships um, with either private sector or academic institutions uh, as well to, to make data sets available. Uh, and we're also seeing the, the private sector step up and start to share more and more data uh, with state governments to help them, whether it's to, to do modeling or understand you know, how people are moving, moving about during the crisis. Um, I think some of the challenges that we see particularly at the state level are um, in many ways based on what is in essence the, the sort of end user of state level open data. Who is that audience? We're kind of seeing uh, during the pandemic that it's going to be journalists, uh, academics, modelers. There's, there's all this interest in it. Uh, when hopefully this crisis is over, um, will those organizations still have the same level of interest in state state level open data? The, the thing we consistently hear uh, across states is really who's actually working with our open data? Um, how do we improve feedback loops, uh, understand who our users are, um, and how states can, can really improve it? So states really, um, I think, want to continue to grow uh, in, in their availability and accessibility of open data, but I think there's often a struggle to figure out uh, who the audience is when, especially we've seen, I think, predominantly at the city level, in large urban areas, you have a more concentration of maybe civic-minded technologists or private sector companies that can really harness that data and, and sort of turn it into something at a city level, but if you're in uh, North Dakota or even here in Connecticut, where our biggest city is 125,000 people, um, you know we we don't tend to see that payoff at the state level. Um, so I think that's that's sort of the thing that's going to really help um, supercharge states in a way is, is kind of now that the, there's this new sort of focus, whether it's on these unemployment systems that aren't working, there, there's sort of this renewed interest in state level government that I think will in turn generate uh, renewed interest or increased interest in uh, state level data. Great, thanks. Thanks, Tyler. And, and I will come back to some of your uh, uh, observations, especially with regard to demand, which is another aspect, as I mentioned, of our third wave of open data, which is really about how do we understand demand and how do we then align the supply to actually meet that demand in a more effective uh, manner. Uh, using potentially data collaboratives as a as a vehicle, um, but Rudy uh, would love your reactions to what Tyler uh, mentioned here. As 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 you said, you are in charge of driving open governance at the local level, uh, uh, which of course has different meaning. It's not like local has one <laughs> one concept or different levels of local, right? New York City turns out to be local. Uh, uh, and has the same size as where I'm initially from, which is Belgium. And so, um, uh, and so I would like to um, get a sense of you, Rudy, whether what Tyler mentioned resonated with you, or do you see this uptake uh, of actually uh, principles of open data, or at least the use of open data following 
um, uh, of course, during uh, COVID-19, but also um, um, how do you uh, see the evolution of open government, open data at the local level? Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree with, 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 with Tyler Vision on the, on, on the acceleration. And I think what we are seeing this year in terms of, of uh, the lessons we are seeing, we are seeing lessons from uh, countries at locals with better data infrastructure and the capacity to answer to the pandemic. So the response and the recovery uh, process works much differently. We are seeing uh, locals without any sort of, of, of data infrastructure or digital capacity to be thinking and looking into that into data more than ever because they need to understand transportation issues, population issues, uh, how many infected. So I think the, the gap between information and, 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 and public sector is it's, it's getting closer and you are seeing the importance of, of improving your capacity to, to respond and to react uh, to the decisions you need to make having that, that data available. I think also internationally, we see how important, uh, if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, how China was releasing the data sets regarding the information of the virus worldwide and how that um, was a, a, a very interesting also example on, on, those, uh, on that important concept of how we share and talk about uh, a, a pandemic and the important to have everything, uh, a, a way to understand that data in a, in a, in a better way. So I think, uh, in, in the case of, of the Open Government Partnership and the work we are doing right now in, in, in Open Government, is we are trying to separate a little bit the concepts, right? Because uh, I think it's important to understand that when you start, um, and I think in this third wave is it's, it's the perfect uh, narrative for that uh, evolution in which you need to first make sure that you have in place the infrastructure for citizens to be able to ask questions and the very basic things you need to ask uh, to the government. So access to information law, those sorts of inf infrastructure need to be there first. You cannot start building uh, open data without having those, those basic uh, concepts. Of course, open data run, I think during the second wave, it has accelerated by now in the third wave, I think it's important to separate this concept and what we are seeing as more government starts to enter into, into digital strategies, into, into digitalization efforts, uh, in different ways, in different sectors, um, you start seeing how important it's to understand data as a part of a general infrastructure that you need to put together. No? So beyond transparency, which of course is important, it's a way to better control, monitoring, and add value to the, to the, to the release of data, uh, I think it's important to understand that, 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 that data and open data needs to be part of an overall uh, strategy regarding what are you, what you are being to build. And this is very important in terms of how important this agenda uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's being um, engaged in, in the different strategies of digital, digitalization. And, and, and talking about data collaboratives, during, during my experience in the G20, this was one of the big discussions we had. No, it's how we add value to all that information in digitalization. Uh, how do we also bring other stakeholders to also take into account that perimeter that you need to build around digitalization and open data initiatives regarding privacy, regarding security, and how important is also to bring that open government angle into, into, into that work. Because you can, you can build a better digital infrastructure, you can have a great, great strategy with a lot of information. We are seeing this happening in different countries, but at, at at some point, you also need to bring civil society into the table to make sure that you create safe spaces for the discussions that you're going to have, because there are decisions that you need to take. Uh, and it's important to do this in, in a more open way. So open government becomes really, really a way, I think, um, of, of, of uh, increasing importance in order to elaborate these, uh, these strategies for digitalization. Right, Rudy, and, 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 and I totally uh, agree with you is that in some of the work we've done on open data and especially uh, around uh, how do we the, st strengthen the demands of open data are not feasible if there is also no open government kind of strategy at the same time. Because you do need to have like this openness within government to listen 
uh, to the demand side in order to have a demand-driven open data <laughs> initiative. And I think that's why it's so crucial to not only focus on open data, but also have an open, I guess, strategy attached to open data because that makes it feasible to be more demand-driven. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's, it's more of a, you know, a push strategy and never really achieves that kind of push-pull kind of uh, uh, benefit uh, of uh, doing open data differently. And so let's go to Cara, meaning uh, the private sector was already mentioned several times and also uh, Rudy uh, alerted that we need to really understand uh, the value of data and, and, and expand that notion. And so what would, I would love to learn from you, Cara, uh, how you are interacting uh, uh, as a private sector player uh, in the data space. I mean, obviously you have a lot of data and how do you then uh, um, leverage that data to inform uh, decision makers such as governments and what kind of partnerships, collaborations uh, do you see emerging uh, uh, coming out of uh, all your work that you've been doing? Well, first of all, I wanna say I agree with my co-panelists that we have made significant progress. And I'd like to point out that it's a, probably a good thing that we had the first wave and the second wave before we got to this COVID situation. If we all think about what we, we would be up against if we were looking at data sharing and collaboration, if we did not already have made, if we had not made so many strides in terms of open data, open government sharing and data collaboration. So ha having said that, I, I do see that there's been more open data sharing at all government levels. And there's also been some true engagement at the private sector level. And I'd like to highlight a, a few examples. The first is the activities of the mobility data providers, the, the scooter companies, the, the bike shares and, and so on. The second is the standardization efforts that are really fostering further collaboration between public and private sector. And also the third is a recognition by private sector companies with social equity as part of their mission and value proposition that it's very important to collaborate with government and, and others to solve some, some problems, major, major challenges. And fast forwarding now to the, to the COVID situation, I'd like to share a, an experience that I had at, at Streetlight. And this is in the form of what we call VMT or vehicle miles traveled. When the COVID-19 pandemic started, we thought, what can we possibly do to help in this situation? We didn't have a lot of time to worry about fancy license agreements and so on. And we went to our partner Cubic and we said, what can we do together? And what we did was we came up with a free VMT monitor that, that we've set out to the world. And it's gotten quite a lot of uptake to help offer perspective at a time when with transportation, you can't go and measure traffic. I mean, you just can't send people out to the field and, and do that. The streets emptying, manual measurement wasn't an option. So how could we possibly provide this very critical stat? And in doing so, the, the goodwill that it created was really tremendous. We saw hundreds of news stories uh, using our vehicle miles count, uh, counts to inform the public to tell the public about what's going on in their cities. And we also got quite a lot of leads on the, on the commercial side. Um, in addition, it also has helped us in working with researchers to better understand the relationships between mobility and the spread of COVID-19. And for example, we did something, we've done something with Rice University and also with LADOT to manage the availability of transportation services specifically to underserved populations throughout the pandemics. And I, I think it's important to highlight that, that these are 
presenting us with opportunities to actually look at serving underserved populations. Um, and the last thing I, I want to share is that in the transportation world, it's important to recognize that, that there is no single company or government that has the full visibility over the trans, transportation landscape, especially now. So we must engage in open data sharing and collaboration. Otherwise, we will be stuck. Great, thanks. Kara, um, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what exact data set uh, we are talking about? So I know Cubic, of course, and, and, and Cubic is more of location intelligence, but, but you enriched that with other data. Right. Or is that, yeah. Right, so uh, we, we work with Cubic on a number of uh, different fronts. They're a, a supplier to us for our transportation metrics. Specifically, what, what we did was we came up with leveled, which is a very uh, count in the transportation world, looking at every single count in the contiguous United States to help figure out happening with the by day and by week. You know, you, you've, you've seen the statistics saying that travel, vehicle miles traveled went down 95%, but now it starts creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. That is a very important statistic, a very important economic indicator that is useful across society. Right, that's useful. And, and so um, coming to um, um, something that I will ask Tyler as well in a second, but uh, starting with you, um, uh, Kara, is that um, one of the elements that uh, we have looked into with regard to data collaborations, i.e. working with the private sector around data like uh, the one that you have, one of the elements that we have uh, identified is that it's very hard to engage with the private sector if you don't know who to talk to. <laughs> and uh, I always made the back joke is that it's uh, data scientists complain that 60% of their time is spent on cleaning the data. And then we always say, and the other 60% is spent on finding the person who can open up the data. And, uh, and, and which is why we uh, have uh, developed this concept of, we need data stewards like yourself, uh, Kara, in order to really navigate this uh, public-private kind of relationship. So tell us a little bit about your own position as a data steward and, and, and what are the, um, the skill sets that uh, you feel are necessary in order to scale data collaboration uh, to a level that uh, uh, we feel anyway, is necessary? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I am, I don't view myself as the only data steward, for example, in my organization. And I think that that's very important an important takeaway for public and private sector, that regardless of whether you're a city planner, you're an IT expert, or you're a, a privacy expert, you need to make sure that you have multiple touch points, that you have multiple data stewards throughout the organization. So for example, at, at Streetlight, we have a data partnerships person who has the eyes and ears on data stewardship and other data, uh, data sources that are available. We also have somebody who's responsible for our academic research program. They are also a data steward. We also have people who are data scientists and they are constantly on the lookout for other uh, interesting data collaboration efforts. So to summarize, I think that it's not, it's not one size fits all and we need multiple data stewards across organizations. Great, awesome. Thanks so much, Kara. And of course I could anyway, go on that topic forever with you, but uh, uh, going to Tyler, uh, having been a chief data officer, uh, um, do you think a chief data officer has the, in the current, uh, and of course you have also your network, uh, uh, um, in the current um, configuration of what the role of a chief data officer is, do you think a chief data officer has the capability to be more of a data steward or are the immediate tasks of actually 
anyway, building the infrastructure and serving uh, internal clients uh, uh, are, are those taking over uh, and should have a, a more uh, designated uh, set of data stewards uh, across government? Yeah, I, uh, so I think what, what we would envision as, as sort of the model is, is the latter example there where, um, so if you think about how state level government works, you have, um, if you have a chief data officer, they exist in an, uh, a, an agency and then you have a Department of Health and Human Services and a Department of Transportation and um, they have, those are in some ways very different data, but uh, transportation can be a healthcare issue and healthcare can rely on transportation as well. Um, and so what we're seeing emerge is uh, a, a sort of statewide role for a chief data officer. And now we're starting to see these individual agencies create uh, chief data officer positions where um, they require more depth of subject matter expertise on in terms of both data and mission of the agency, um, and as well as then sort of a level deeper having data stewards within lines of business, for lack of a better term. Uh, because I think it's really hard for uh, somebody in a statewide position to be both an expert in child welfare um, and agriculture, right? That's that's just uh, probably not going to be a skill set. So you have to have this sort of breadth of knowledge of government functions and then work more collaboratively with uh, stewards and, and, you know, officials at those individual agencies as partners. Great. Stefan, can I... Um Type of in course, something of there. course, of course. This is the, the ultimate dream is of having panelists start talking to themselves so that I can, anyway, stay out of the picture here. But yeah, go ahead. I'd, like to, I'd like to pick up on something that, that Tyler said. Great example with regards to transportation being a health problem and vice versa. With COVID, what we're seeing is this increased awareness and this intersection of personal health information, public health information, transportation planning, and all of these other things. And we can't uh, e expect that everyone is going to be a subject matter expert in all of these different things. And I think that that is a great example of why we need to have data stewards across the organization in different areas at different levels to help uh, help solve these these issues. And 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 yeah, and we've also been advocating for the creation uh, of more bilinguals, i.e., people that have a domain expertise and a data expertise, so that they also anyway see the opportunity of data within their own domain uh, 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 happening and and leveraging that uh, more. And so it seems to me, Woody, that uh, a lot of what we are talking about is about uh, skills uh, within government and outside of government. And I want to ask you, Woody, given the fact that you've been uh, such a leader in uh, uh, making sure that uh, government officials um, um, acquire new skills, especially skills that uh, can accommodate new demands, uh, both from an innovation, government innovation point of view, but also from a data point of view. And so I would love to get your sense really on uh, what's the role of um, skills in this space and do we have enough uh, skilled people to really leverage this third wave of uh, open data? No, of course we, we, uh, of course we don't have enough people. Uh, and this is a problem I think we all struggle with on having how you, how you make government also a place in which uh, technology profiles can, can stay and how you make sure that they stay in the government. And, 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 and I think this is, this is a struggle. And there are different strategies no, uh, for, uh, for that. But I think overall, uh, one of our, our obsessions working with that in Buenos Aires and in Argentina was always to make sure that the areas have the, the, the data at hand to, to take decisions and someone was able also to see uh, all that data. That's why I'm going back again to the, to the idea of the architecture and how you see that it's important to have someone that, that can actually understand what happens from, from one uh, area to, to another area and making sure that the teams uh, have, have the skills to manage uh, the data, at least to understand what they need to do. And also they have the capacity um, 
to 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 work and, and, and cooperate in a different way. And I think this is another thing that that it's always uh, mentioned in, in regarding the, the these new skills, no, for the for for the public sector, which is are not only technical skills. We don't need everyone to be a data scientist, of course. But at least you need to understand what are you able to, what are the new sources of data, what are the conversations you need to have, where is the information, how we are going to cope with new technologies providing data, what are the risks of that. And that's a whole set of, of, of concerns that need to be addressed by, by, by a, a, a skill program. What we did in Argentina is we worked with the School of Government, the National Institute of Government, and we understand that those are the places in which you need to invest in order to bring those capacities as part of a natural program of training within the, within the public sector. So uh, labs and special trainings and workshops, et cetera, et cetera, that's all fantastic. It's great. I think all the strategies are good. But if you don't make sure that the area, the office, the institute, responsible for training, responsible for making that public sector sustainable in terms of capacities, you're going to be uh, making a, a, a big mistake. And I think what we have learned with open data, and this is, I think, one of the great things is that it has accelerated the internal conversation. It has accelerated where is the data, what is the problem, what are the skills that I'm, that I'm seeing. And that has become a very important source for, for developing uh, different, different strategies and starting to think about, about data in a different way and see what, what, are, what, what can you do and what, what things can you do. And I think there is a lot of appetite for this sort of, of trainings and capacity building inside the government, but important to keep it uh, using the, the, the infrastructure that you already have in place. Uh, because at the same time, you have a lot of professionals that have been working with data for a long time in the government. I mean, this is not we are discovering uh, something, something new here, but you need to dis distribute a little bit more that knowledge and also cope with the new with the new set of skills. So I think again, um, uh, schools of government play a, a fundamental role uh, in this sort of and, and that's where also data collaboratives can play a role, no? Uh, in, in 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 finding ways to bring different stakeholders, create conversations, create a safe space for 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 talking about this uh, inside the government. You can bring a lot of innovation and creativity in how you do it. And how you bring that alive in, in, in inside a government and making people also enthusiastic about about this and what what you see and, and how can you do it, but important to keep it uh, to keep it sustainable in time. Great. Um, so with that um, uh, last remark, uh, let me go to Kara and, uh, and and touch on the uh, issue of sustainability. Uh, and especially if you are developing uh, data collaboratives, um, how can you um, uh, do this in a sustainable manner? By which I mean, especially from a private sector point of view, uh, how do you make a business case uh, for actually uh, uh, working around the data that you collect in a manner that can generate insight that can improve people's lives? I go back to my, my first point about how not one company or one government department has all the information that they need. So to me, it is a given, it is fundamental that we are working in, the, in this, these, this age of data collaboratives and we, we really need to do this. One of the things that I think is going to make this more sustainable and help it grow is to focus on the purposes. So to ask the question, for what reason am I collecting this data and how do I anticipate using it? And do I need for this particular use case real-time data or can I use archival data? And if I can use archival data for 90% of my transportation planning use cases, then for what purpose am I requiring private sector to give data, ongoing data dumps of, of this live, live data. And I think that everyone has this appetite for more and more and more data, but I think that we need to very narrowly focus on the use cases and say, what data do I need for what purposes? And to not just collect it because you think that someday you may have some, some purpose for it. And I, I think that that goes 
to part of what Rudy was talking about is working with the infrastructures that you have in place. And if you have very eager people who want to think of all these brilliant ways that they can, they can use the data, that's great, but that may not further the institutional or societal priorities. Great. Um, thanks. Thanks, Cara. Very insightful. And uh, I think we, we've entered the um, make a wish uh, 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 part of this uh, uh, series. And so, uh, Tyler, uh, if I would give you a magic wand and say uh, you can use it on one thing to make uh, uh, the third wave a reality or more of a reality, uh, what would be your priority? Um, I, I think uh, to touch on Rudy's comment earlier, we need more capacity uh, at, the, at the state and subnational level. Um, chief data officers are they're often just one person in state government trying to open data, share data, do all sorts of things. Some are lucky enough to have three or four people. And then as you get into those individual agencies, again, they just lack the capacity um, to do this in a very thoughtful manner. So um, I think for me, the, if I had the magic wand, I would send you know, five to 10 uh, talented individuals to every, every state in this country. Uh, and I think we'd start to see more progress. Great, thanks so much. Um, uh, so, so very important to invest in the human infrastructure in addition to the uh, technical as well. Rudy, um, if you would have a, uh, a magic uh, genie uh, that uh, you can ask uh, uh, a wish uh, and you only have one uh, option, what would you, what would you ask? Uh, make coronavirus disappear? Can I, I, I read that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, anyway, that's a given. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think, I, I, to be honest, I, 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 I totally, I, I will build on, on, on Tyler's comment. I think um, capacity building inside the government, this is a conversation we are seeing today, accelerated today by COVID on, on, on skills and also uh, the big uh, data gaps, skills gap that we are seeing people affected. Um, so I think, I think this is, this is important. No, the future is here, but it's not evenly distributed. And I think with skills, it's exactly the same thing. We are seeing a lot of innovation happening outside the government. We are going to, we are seeing the, the growth of the GovTech also uh, narrative, which is very interesting um, to bring like new services and just right, creating those connections between between the government data and new sort of services that can, can, can bring new ideas to the table. And you need to have that internal knowledge distributed uh, uh, following on, 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 on Cara's comment to making sure that every area that has the specific knowledge on a specific theme has also that skill set to, en to engage in those sort of conversations, that, that everyone feels that it's part of. That's why I think it's not only and I, wanna, I don't want to make, make, make the comment too technocratic or, or, or digital optimistic in this sense, because I think those training uh, programs, those capacity building programs regarding to, 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 to digitalization, to, to acceleration of, of the digitalization, need to be very broad. No? You, you need to also understand how uh, to better work with other teams, how to better cooperate with other teams, how, what's the logic and... and, and and COVID has accelerated that, that situation, no? has put us on the, on the situation of the transportation um, ministry or unit need to talk with the health ministry, need to talk with the sanitation, et cetera. Et cetera. And so you need also, uh, that's why I think in, in regarding the skills, this is, I think, the important, the important lesson, lesson here. And most of the capacities are there. It's not like you need to invent something new or create a new narrative. No, it's how to bring that sort of innovations happening outside and, and, and probably on the second wave, all the data hackathons, the awards, the different things that we have done in order to create more engagement and bring new ideas from entrepreneurs and data scientists have been helping to create like this uh, idea of, the, of what we can do. No, it's very important also to show uh, public servants and especially authorities what can happen when this information is also out there and we have the capacities to create something new uh, um, with, with, with this information and we can cooperate uh, better. So I think those are things that can be trained and today are already being used a lot for, for in, in, the, in, the, 
in the SME sector, especially regarding new technologies. Great, thanks, Rudy. And it reminded me also of uh, actually that I guess the, the, one of the first times when we engaged was around this concept of even building an expert uh, network that actually would understand who knows what within government. And 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 I feel like. Uh, uh, because the assumption quite often is indeed is that we don't have any capacity in government uh, and that we need to find it or create it, but that ultimately uh, uh, what we tried to do with the expert network was to even try to understand who knows what and how can we then connect that. And so uh, uh, it seems to me that if we only had uh, f uh, figured that out, uh, uh, we would have probably uh, of course, and you've done quite a lot of work in that space as well, but that seems to be still a, an important objective. Uh, uh, would you agree with that, Rudy? Yeah, I mean, definitely. And you're going back to a very, very <laughs> basic, basic problem in the government, no? that, 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 that sort of silos and, yeah. and, and, and capacity uh, like distributed. And, 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 and when you work in government, the only thing you have against you is time. So how to accelerate that, that, that knowledge sharing, who knows what, um, it's, 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 and, and, and then again, you see where, where open data can play an important role. No? When, you launch, when, we, when we launch the strategy in Buenos Aires, we sort of concentrate the data, the data collection in, in, the, in, in, in our office. So we, we, we brought those knowledge here. And then at the national level, we distribute that uh, responsibility to create be better capacities in the different, in the different areas. But open, an, an open data strategy gives you really fast some sort of inventory of who has the data, who manages, what's the format, who is in charge of this, what are the problems, why, what are the rules that I need to put in place in order to share that data. So I think, I think those strategies are also very useful in terms of how to accelerate that knowledge and, 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 and that kind of creates a, that uh, realization as you were mentioning of, of how important it's to improve the way how knowledge is distributed inside, uh, inside, uh, inside the government. Great, great. Kara, you, you have the last word. Uh, so if, if you would have a magic wand, uh, what would be your, uh, your wish and uh, uh, priority? I agree that education, training, capacity building are all very important. But I, I think that if we turn this all on its head and we think about how governments are there to serve citizens and Let's put the citizens first and think, okay, what are the top 10 challenges that I'm trying to deal with, to solve the problems I'm trying to solve within my government, whether it's state, regional or local government, what are the top 10 things that I'm trying to solve? And that's a use case approach. And you start with number one and you say, okay, this is the number one, uh, thing that I'm trying to help, that I'm trying to provide to my citizens. In order to solve this, who are all the stakeholders who need to be involved? What is the open data that I have available in my portfolio that I can walk down the hall and I can get? Who are the public, the private sector partners that I can turn to, whether they're the ones that you're already working with or ones that you just found on, on the internet? And in that way, you can use that information to then go out and do citizen engagement and get people interested and in understanding why you are collecting this data, what you are doing with taxpayer dollars, and how this is facilitating everything from contact tracing to figuring out where new bus and, and bike routes need to uh, be put in place. Right, so, so you would advocate, which is very interesting because I've been uh, having several conversations about uh, what you here proposed. So you would advocate a more mission-driven kind of uh, uh, approach to, to actually building collaboratives and, and, and even organizing towards yes. actually solving problems that are uh, deemed to be prioritized. Yes, because otherwise we are just swimming in the mess of all of this what people have been calling uh, big data. And no matter how well we as private sector companies or individual governments are good at organizing our silo, uh, our space, the only way that the data is useful is if we are solving real world problems. Great, well, 
couldn't think of a better closure of this uh, uh, panel. Thanks so much, Kara, uh, Tyler, Rudy. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to the audience for uh, staying uh, loyal to our summer of open data. And thanks also to our partners, the Open Data Institute, the Open Data Charter, BrightHive, and Data Gov Hub. Thank you and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.